Another big one here. Yeah, this is another big moroides. So masks on. Mask on, because there'll be a few hairs floating around. Gloves on. Gloves on. And I've got lots of nice dark fruit. So the hairs will become airborne even on a still day like this. Yeah. And sometimes, because it's a still day, it's a bit more of a problem because it means they're floating around the plant. So it's like a cloud of silica. Yeah, sometimes when you look up to the sunlight, you can see the hairs floating off the leaf. But we'd have to be careful of this leaf here. This close one in? This one here. Yep. Because it's more accessible. So you take a step back. Well, I'll go this way. Okay. Just be careful. And you have to watch the top of your head. Yes. Okay, is it clear? Yep, go. Yep. No. There's not a lot of public awareness about the stinging tree, but it's such an intense pain. It is just so, so painful. You know, it's you know as bad or worse than childbirth, and it's just so painful. How many times have you been stung? I've been stung really badly, only once um, to go to hospital, and other bad stings that have brought tears to my eyes maybe about 10 times so oh, yeah. yeah so plenty of experience it's like being burnt and having acid on you at the same time The hair on the leaf, the hair is sitting inside a bowl, and at the end of, of the hair there's also another bulb, a really tiny bulb. So when when the hair goes into the skin, the little bulb at the end is broken off and it becomes sharp like a, a like the end of a hypodermic needle. It goes into the skin and the skin closes over the hair. chemically um, stable, which means it's very difficult to, to um, have a chemical reaction to, to break down the toxin. And that's also why if you've got a dried leaf specimen, even after a hundred years in a herbarium, it can sting you because the toxin is still active after all that time. I'm interested in the, in the concept of pain, in, in that you have some animals that are killed by touching this plant, horses and dogs for instance, yet other animals like native Australian mammals such as um, the green ringtail possum and the red-legged paddy melon that can eat these plants you know, quite happily. The red-legged paddy melon can eat an entire plant like this um, you know, overnight, so the fact that um, they're not affected at all by the pain just leads you to wonder is the whole concept of pain how behavioral is it can people adapt to it behaviorally or how much is it a real physiological element and I think what happens is a lot of these animals learn to overcome the pain they learn to perhaps develop a response where they don't think it's painful anymore so therefore they don't feel the pain A lot of the botanical records are based upon collections that were made in the 1920s. So people avoid this plant, they don't know much. A lot of the tourist areas in North Queensland have stinging trees growing everywhere. Tourists don't know about these plants, a lot of the general public don't know about these plants. So in an ideal world where there's more time and money it would be good to go and find out more about these plants. I think it's the biggest shiny stinging tree I've seen. It's massive because of the buttress roots come right out. A mighty nettle. Maybe 25 metres. Wonder how old it is.
I think there is one or two unidentified species. And so what I'd like to do is to be able to collect the seeds from those species and to grow them through to see if they are new species. So that's, that's one thing I'd, I'd like to do. And I, I think it's just really interesting to work out what's around in the rainforest. And it's something which I never stop doing. So if I'm you know, out for a bush walk or if I'm anywhere, I'm always looking for stinging trees. It just never stops. I always look. It's, it's like something I can't turn off. Yeah, I think it's something I'll always do.